grab your Bibles. We're getting ready to go to the Word. And um, as we go to the Word, I'm coming down again this morning. Um, just want to talk some more and, and share, share with you. So grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to pick up um, there from where I left off last week. I did not get a chance to finish the message on last week. So today we'll spend some time uh, talking through that so that God would move and have his way. What I want to do is I'm going to read this passage of Scripture, Matthew 12, and then we'll um, review a little bit from last Sunday, and then I will land where I want to land. Amen? If you're there, say amen. Let me know you're there by saying amen. 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 Good, good. Um, and then we're going to read. Amen. I like the red suits that the ushers have on. You guys think a red suit would work for me? No, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, be like, it, Topaz says it will. I believe her. Amen. Y'all just going to be hating. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Brother show up in his red and white. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Well, let, let me read and then let's pray. Let's read. I'll read Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. It says, Then a demon possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And it says here in verse 26, And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods Unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, and whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray, and then we're going to go to God's Word. Lord, you're wonderful. God, you are gracious, merciful, and kind. As we open scriptures this morning, speak through me again to your people. I oftentimes say on Sundays, I don't want this first service's anointing. I want your fresh anointing, God, because we are a different people and a new people. So speak afresh. Felix moves himself out of the way, as I say, every single week because it's never about me. You're working in me just like you're working in your people that are here. So open our hearts to be more of who you would have us to be. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen, amen. As we go to this text, um, what I want to do is if you missed last week, I'm just going to encourage you, you can go um, to iTunes, to our podcast, and download the podcast. You can go to our YouTube channel, you can go to our website, you can go to RCF Network, many places, and catch the message from last week. It'll help bring you up to speed so you can kind of know where we are and be in line with us. But today, my goal is to finish up what I started next week, last week. But before I can do that, I need to review just a little bit for those that may have missed last week to kind of level set as the term I'm going to use to put us all on the same page so we can walk through the text to hear what God is saying. Amen? Come on, say amen if you're here. Now, here's how I want to do my introduction, just, just, just a weird, um, turn to the person that's next to you and, um, and say to them, um, if you know their name, call their name, I'm going to say person, if you don't, say person, uh, come on, say it again, yeah, so one more time, say person, if you know their name, yeah, say you don't have to do it, yeah, come on, turn to the next person, make sure y'all looking at somebody, y'all establish eye contact, it's all good, come on, yeah, say person, you don't have to do it. Say, you've got a victor, the victory. <laughs> now point to yourself and say, self, self. I've got the victory. Got One more time. Say, self, self. I've got the victory. Got Amen. Now let me tell you why I'm doing that and why I'm saying that. It's important to me. 
um, that you understand uh, my, my theology and my philosophy of ministry and all that good stuff. I believe spiritual warfare is real, okay? I believe that the enemy is real. I believe that satanic influences, attacks, and oppression, and all that good stuff is real, right? But in the midst of all of that, I also wholeheartedly believe through scriptures that the believer in Christ is more than a conqueror. Come on, say that if you believe that. That means we've got the victory, right? We've already won. And I shared this, this early this week with our staff, is that you're fighting from a point, a point of victory. Here's what that means. Satan can't make you do nothing, right? And this is going to sound even more weird to you. He can't do nothing to you. You got to get this, guys. Y'all done got quiet because now you're like, how come I end up in this situation? Well, if you know God's because you went there. He didn't pick you up and put you there, right? You kind of get what I'm saying? So I want y'all to hear me say that because you're going to walk through this. I think it's very, very important that we understand the powers of, that we have as kingdom subjects. We've already got the victory. I am not saying, please don't hear me say, there is no such thing as spiritual warfare. And I am not saying that you don't have to pray. You have to pray because here's what Scripture says in Ephesians 6, right? The wrestle is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and spiritual forces of evil in high places. And it goes as far as to say, put on the whole armor of God. Now listen to this. So that when the day of evil comes, we'd be able to do what? Yeah, yeah. The Bible doesn't say when the day of evil comes, you'll be running. Oh, come on, yeah. But you'd be able to do what? Take your stand. Come on, y'all know the scripture. And then it says, above all stand. And it talks about the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the blessed breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, and it talks about taking the sword, which is the word of the Spirit, meaning that we are fighting from a posture of victory. So I want, my goal is for us to understand today how much power we have as kingdom subjects and how much the church of God and the people of God need to start, uh, stop this concept of living defeative life, giving the enemy credence and credibility for stuff that we do. Amen. I'm hoping at the end of this that, man, we have so torn the, the kingdom down that the enemy has been served notice that he realized he does not have power over God's people. Come on, I need a few people to say amen. I need a few people to say amen this morning. So I want to look at this text. And this text, I want to get to the back end of the text because last week we spent a long time, a long time just exegeting the text and dealing with the front end, but I did not get to go to the back end. But just for, by way of review, I want to walk you through where we are. So let me tell you what's happening in the text just to bring you up to speed. If you look at verse 22, um, for those that were not here, here is how it opens up. It says, then a demon possessed, or demon oppressed, my translation says, most of your translation says possessed man, um, who was blind and was mute, was brought to him, and the text says, and he healed them, so that the man spoke and saw, okay? Now, what's important in the text as we kind of walk through, because these verses um, starts to level set or set the foundation for what we're going to be talking about on the back end of the text. Notice what the text says. This man that was brought to Jesus, um, he was both blind and he was both mute. And what's important for you to realize in the text, his condition was not a medical deficiency. The text does not give us the implication that there was something wrong with him medically that medicines could fix or that physicians could fix or that pharmaceuticals could fix because I'm willing to bet they tried everything they could before they brought this man to Jesus and they concluded that the reason for his muteness and blindness was the fact that a demon was keeping him from being all he could be. Now the reason I want to point that out, at least they had sense enough to recognize if we can only get him to Jesus, everything's going to be all right. Come on, there's a message there, y'all. If you can only get him to Jesus, everything's going to be all right. And, and notice this. They brought him to Jesus. And notice what the text says, right? The text says that Jesus healed him, and the healing was evidence in the fact that the man spoke 
and he saw, and the people were amazed. Now, here's what I said last week, just by way of brief for you, for you to kind of track with me, is that healing in the Old Testament had all these incantations and all these rituals and all these things that people would, would take people through before they can exercise the demon that was in the individual. Now, here's a parenthetic. I need you to hear me say that I still believe that demon oppression and possession is real in today's day and age. And I want you to hear me say that deliverance is still a real thing that needs to happen in today's day and age. Amen. I want you to hear me say that. I believe that because the enemy is set out to influence people, and we're going to talk about that in a little while, right? But they had all these rituals, and I told Deacon Brown, I like these dude, that, that, they, that, they, that I'm going to use him as my demon dude again today, you know, so he'll get delivered by the end of this, um, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, but, but notice what the text says, and this is what I want to harp on this morning to build a message on. Jesus didn't go through all these rituals and all these stuff and go through all the things. He just simply walked to the man, and listen to what I'm going to say, exercise authority by telling the demon to come out, and the demon left. Now, the amazement in the text is the fact that culturally they had never seen exorcism done that way before. Listen to the crowd. They were amazed, and here's what they said. Could this be the son of David because we've never seen such authority, right? And they're celebrating that maybe the Messiah has finally come amongst us and the Messiah is in the midst, right? And the audience is celebrating the presence and maybe the entrance of the Messiah in their midst because they noticed the authority he had versus um, performing rituals. The problem in the text is not the excitement of the audience, the problem in the text is the religious leaders. Come on, say church folk. Church. Yeah, you're talking about yourself too. Come on, say it again. Say church folk. <laughs> the elders, right? Today's context, deacons, board people, ministers, those people that had a problem with what Jesus did. And I want you to read it with me and notice what they said to him. Notice what they said. Verse 24 said, but when the Pharisees, and in earlier scriptures the scribes said the same thing, when they heard it, Listen to what they said. It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. So the church is celebrating, and the audience is celebrating, and they're excited. And then the church folks sees what he did, and here's what they said to him. This is just review. The reason he doesn't have to go through the rituals and the incarnation is because he's associated with Beelzebul if he is not Beelzebul himself, right? Now, here's what they were saying to Jesus. Beelzebul, and we talked about this last week, could be translated several ways depending on how you read the word, Lord of flies or Lord of heights. But what, here's what they were saying to Jesus. Uh, at the root of it all, Beelzebul could be Satan himself, right? So here's what they're saying to Jesus. The only reason you can walk in such authority and say to that demon, come out, and the demon leaves, is because you, Jesus, did that under the authority of Satan himself, because you are Satan himself, and here's what you're doing. You're simply exercising authority over demons that already follow you. That's the problem with the text, right? That, that you're doing this by the power and the authority of Beelzebub. And that's what creates the tension. That's what creates the argument that Jesus presents. And that's what's going to get us to the next place that I want us to understand because I think it's very, very important as you walk through this text that you hear Jesus' response and you see the power and the authority of God's kingdom people in today's world. So Jesus says five things to them in response. And I don't have time to go into great detail. Listen to the message from last week. You'll get it. Here's the first thing he said. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And we illustrated that and walked through that extensively last week, so I'm not going to go there and spend time with it. And then he continues by saying to them that followers are a direct reflection of their leader. And that's where he says to them, if I'm doing it by Beelzebub, by whom are your sons or your followers doing it? What he's really hinting at them is that you, yourselves, scribes and Pharisees, must be followers of Satan, right? 
But then he gets down, and then he says this whole, this other thing that's very, very important for us today. In God's kingdom, there is no neutral ground. So here's what that means. You can't say, I'm in the kingdom, but I'll play it safe and keep one foot in the kingdom and the other in the world. Come on, y'all, say there's no middle ground. Come on, talk to me. Let me know you're here. Say there's no middle ground. You can't keep one foot in the kingdom and the other in the world. You must draw a line and decide whether you're going to follow God or not, right? So he says that, and then, then he goes into this interesting thing. Notice what he says. Before I even read the screen, let me tell you. Look at verse, what verse is that? 28. Look at verse 28. Very, very important. Notice what he says in verse 28, because this is important stuff. And then he says here, if Satan, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? Look at the next verse. And if I cast out demon by Beelzebul, by whom do your son cast him out? Look at verse 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has done what? Oh, yeah, I got to get this one more time. Let me read that one more time. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has what? Repeat after me. Say, the kingdom of God is now. So here's what Jesus says to them, and this is what I want you to hear. So here's what he says. The presence of the Spirit is proof positive that God's kingdom is here. So here's what Jesus says, and he says, listen to me, listen to me, scribes and Pharisees, um, I'm telling you that this did not happen by the power of Beelzebul, but I'm telling you how it happened. The Spirit of God has entered into the world, and the Spirit of God is doing a work. And by virtue of the fact that I'm now able to exercise authority over the demon that had this man mute and blind is proof positive that something else is going on. And I want you to hear me say, scribes and Pharisees, that it is indicative of the truth that the kingdom of God is now and the presence of God is here because something new is happening. Oh, y'all ought to get excited about that. Here's how I said it Sunday, right, last week. The goal, the goal, the goal of, of Satan is, is to make sure that every person alive on the face of the earth has a demon on the inside of them such that he can control them, right? The goal of the church, the goal of the people of God is to go to every demon possessed or oppressed person and cast the demon out of them because God has empowered us. So our job is to tear the kingdoms down that the devil is trying to build in the earth. But I want you to hear this lesson. You've got the ability and the power to do it. Oh, my gosh. And that's the argument Jesus is trying to make, right? If I did this, if I did this, and I didn't have to go through all the incantations and the rituals and all that stuff, if all I said was demon come out and the demon left, it's indicative of the truth that something else has happened because the way you all were doing it before, you are unable to heal this guy. Amen. Oh. And it's a notice what he says. Look at the next thing, right? Look at the next thing, and then this is, this is going to help you. So Satan now is defeated as a result of the power of the kingdom's presence. This is what we say. Therefore I tell you, no, verse 30, no, not 29. I want to read 29. How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus is a trip. Here's what he says. All right, you want to call me Satan? Um, or call my authority by that of Satan? Several arguments. House divided against itself can't stand. Satan's not going to drive out Satan. Then he says, you can't be neutral ground. Can I get what I'm saying? And then he says this, but what I did had nothing to do with Satan, and it's a revelation or a demonstration that something new has entered the earth realm. So then he says in that point, let me tell you how I did it. Come on, say, sir, what's how, preacher? Y'all come on, y'all talk to me. Come on, say, sir, what's how, preacher? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to show it. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, he says, Satan is defeated as a result of the power of the kingdom's, listen to the word, presence. Satan is already defeated by the power of the kingdom's presence. On the surface, here's what that means. All kingdom subject has to do is show up. And the devil has to run. All, all kingdom subjects have to do, I, that's, that's my goal today is that we get this, is show up and the devil has to run, right? So, so let me read the text and then I will walk through process and then we're going to say, here's what he says. Um, How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. And he makes this strange statement in verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me or whoever does not gather with me he does what? He scatters. So process. Let me walk you through process real quick, okay? Um, four things real quick. So here's what Jesus says. Number one, number one, number one, the reason I'm able to exercise authority is this. He says this. First of all, the Holy Spirit enters the place. Come on, say, let Jesus in. Say it again. Say, let Jesus in. This is, this is sweet. I love this. Because here's what he said to the scribes and Pharisees that they may have missed it. I'm hoping that you don't miss. The reason that demon was able to come out and that demon had to go and lock into this is because the first thing I did, I, I entered in. Oh, y'all, 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 y'all. Oh, are you getting this? You get it. Now, if you know anything about the presence of the Holy Spirit and God himself, when he enters in, he don't need to say nothing. Or do nothing, no demons in their right mind can cohabitate in any place. I wish I had somebody where Jesus is. Come on, does this make sense? So lock into this. By virtue of the fact that he entered into the man, that he entered into the place, the demons that were there by default had to go. Here's how one scripture says, demons tremble at the mere sound of his name. Imagine what they do in his presence. Y'all know the scripture. There was one place where he was walking by and a bunch of demons was just floating around in this person. Here's what they said. Did you show up to cast us out or to deal with us? And, they, and he said, no, no, no. Then they said, at least let us go into the swine. So hear me. When Jesus showed up, nothing malicious Delicious can be in his presence when he occupies a house. Come on, say amen to that. So, so lock into this. The first thing he did was he went in. If, if, if you have accepted Christ in your life as personal Lord and Savior, that ought to be a nugget for you, but you can't be saved if he hasn't. In- So excuse my confidence, right? I know who's in me. Come on. If you know God, you ought to know who's in you. And I'm trying to say if he's in you, greater is he that is where? In me than he that is what? In the world. So listen to this. If he enters in. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. He's on board, y'all. He's on board. You kind of get what I'm saying? Do I have a witness that he's on board? Come on, he's on board, he's on board, he's on board. Then lock into this, lock into this, lock into this. The first thing he does, he goes in. And then the second thing, the Holy Spirit binds the strong man. So here's what that means, here's what that means. If there is something in me that has a strong hold on my life, by virtue of the fact that Jesus enters my life, that thing that had a stronghold on me is already defeated by the default status because of who is on board. Oh, y'all not getting this. You know. So let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you. Bro, Patrick, if you got a substance addiction, right, assuming you're addicted to something, and that thing has been a strong man in your life for many years, and that thing has a hold on you that you can't help yourself. Come on. You getting high. You stealing TVs. You selling cars. Come on. You, you, just, you just treating people bad because your strong man is speaking to you. Then Jesus enters in. Oh! Who's the strong? I wish I had somebody now. Who's the strong man now? And 
here's what he does. When he comes in, the first thing he does is binds the strong man so he positioned himself in a place of strength. Here's what that means. If God is on board and you're still talking about there's strongholds in my life and it ain't Jesus, y'all don't like me. Come on, fool me. Say amen, y'all. Let me know you're here. I'm going somewhere with this. I want us to get this, right? The reason he enters is he first binds the strong man. He binds that thing that has a grip on you, a thing that has a hold on you. So here's what we've been doing. If you're a child of God, walking around, allowing something that has you, that's already defeated, still having a hold on you. Oh my gosh. This is why I'm saying you don't gotta, you don't, we don't have to do it, y'all. You've already won, right? You don't have to do it because Jesus is not going to enter. I said this last week and tell addiction, hey man, move over, all right? I'm going to sit right here and I'm going to leave you here for a while. It don't work like that with Christ. Oh, come on. Come on, y'all. If he enters, he has authority. He binds the strong man. And look at number three. Then the Holy Spirit plunders the strong man's house. Let me tell you what that means. I don't know if you've ever been robbed. Come on, y'all just too cool up in here. Um, I don't know if you've ever been, but when a person robs you, they don't go in your bedroom and open your drawer and look for your jewelry and stop and fold everything back up nice and neat and put it back because I don't need them to. No, 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 no. You go in your bedroom, there's clothes everywhere. Come on, jewelry everywhere. And you leave the bathroom and they did the same thing in the bathroom, the same thing in the kitchen. Come on, the same thing in the living room. They ransack everything. That's what Jesus says. I don't just come into your heart and live in your heart. Come on. I leave the heart and I go to your head. And anything that has a hole on you, I deal with it. Then I go to your hands. Then I go to your feet. And by the time I get done, I've got all of you. All of you. All of you. I plunder any place the strong man has set up. Gosh, I'm passionate about this because God is showing me me. If there's places in my life that I claim Jesus lives, but there's still weaknesses, is he in the room or not? Come on, y'all talk to me this morning. And I know I'm not just talking about me. I know there's at least two people in here that can identify with what I'm saying. Come on, are you with me? He plunders the house. And what I love about it is he doesn't move out after he's broke in. Oh, Jesus. It says that he inhabits, number four, the place bringing healing. You kind of get what I'm saying? The eyes are open. It says the mute see, the mute talk. So here's what happens. If you couldn't talk before, Patrick, he doesn't just stay in your heart. He sets up a spirit there, his, then he goes to your mouth and releases that thing. Amen. Amen. Oh, I wish I had you. Whatever had a stronghold in our life. So here's what the text says. This is the beauty of verses 22 and 23. Jesus healed him, and it tells you the, the manifestation of the healing. He could speak, and he could see. So, so check this out theologically. Don't fool yourself into thinking that the reason you still do what you do is because Jesus hasn't occupied that part of your heart yet or your life. He has. So your temptation is not internal, it's external. Come on, come on, come on, man. You can't get what I'm saying? Why you say that, preacher? Because Jesus lives in me. I wish I had a church that says Jesus on board, right? And if he's on board, I want y'all to get this. If he's on board, he's not just hanging out in my fingers. That's why Grandma them used to say this. I can feel him in my hands, right? 
because they wanted to just give you another one when you got on their reserve nerve, but I could feel him in my hand and he held me back. Come on. I could feel him in my feet because I wanted to go places I had no business going, and he just grabs a hold of my feet and said, no, 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 your foot belonged to me. Then he says, I realize I can feel him all, I wish I had somebody all over me, and here's what that looks like. Here's what that looked like before when I wanted to go do, become, whatever, all of a sudden because Jesus is on board. Demons don't have access anymore. And everything changes. It's new. It changes. Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he's a what? The what has gone? All has gone. And the new has come. Listen, all this is what? From God. I thank God. So here's a quick application, people. Here's a quick application. And there's two I want to talk to, but I'm going to skip over just in the interest of time. That you got to understand that, that the church of God, here's why I said this. We have power. We have power. We have power. We have power. Okay? Individually. Felix, you've got power. Patrick, you've got power. Regina, you've got power. Annie, You've got, you kind of get what I'm saying, Len? You've got power. So here's what that means, here's what that means, here's what that means, here's what that means. When the enemy comes outside, and this is the spiritual warfare, if he climbs up on your back and you chose to bring him to prayer meeting with you, uh, yo, uh, I got a heavy burden. I need y'all to pray. If you choose to bring him up in here, up in here, up in here, that's your choice. Because you've got the power to flick. I wish I had somebody <laughs> before he can climb on. I wish I had somebody. Resist the devil and he'll do what? Draw near to God and he will do that. Draw near to you. And here's what the scripture says. By virtue of the fact that he entered in. So here's all the enemy can do. He can walk around you. Prowling like a roaring lion. Seeking whom... He may devour. And that's all he can do. He can walk around you, prowling like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Y'all didn't hear me. Here's all he can do. He can walk around you like a roaring lion, looking for some. I wish I had somebody here. Here's what the tell y'all. All he can do is he can walk around you all day long, and he can set up camp, and he can look at you. Guess what he can't do? He can't come in there and just, because like MC Hammer wrote a song about it. <laughs> yeah, y'all get it, yeah. All he can do is look and prowl. How dare you say he's on my back? How'd he get there? Because all he can do is because he knows who's on the inside. I wish I had somebody. He knows who's on the inside. He knows who's on. You got to get your theology straight. He knows who's on the inside. Does this make sense? So let me move on. Let me move on. So watch this. So watch the text. The, the argument's still there. Let me clear some things up. This is what I want to do. So he says this, right? Verse 31. Therefore I tell you, Jesus still speaking, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. People. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in what? The age to come. A couple of things I want to talk through and walk through now so we can kind of wrap this up. So the issue now, what is this issue of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and this issue of unforgivable forgivable sin? Because here's what Jesus said now to the scribes and Pharisees. You're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. You're committing the sin of blasphemy. And it is unforgivable. And so what does that mean all about? I don't want to deal with that last week because that could be confusing on top of all of this. So let's walk this out. Here's what he's saying. Now to begin, let's talk about the word blasphemy. What does it mean? What is it all about? Here's what blasphemy means. Just simply by definition, to speak against someone in such a way as to harm or injure him or her or their reputation. Um, the second one, say harmful, abusive speech against someone's reputation, 
slander, revile, or reviling. Speaking, look at number two, predominantly of speech that is against the nature and power of God. So blasphemy simply means to speak ill, to speak against, to revile, to blaspheme, right? So what does all of this have to do with the text? And what is all this saying that we need to understand as it relates to what blasphemy is? So number one, I need you to understand is there's two forms of blasphemy. Come on, say two forms. Once again, say two forms. Two forms, two forms of blasphemy. The first one is one can blaspheme humans and they can blaspheme even God and Jesus. So here's what that means, and I'll show you in the text. I can speak bad about my brother all day long. That's blasphemy, blasphemy in a form, but even in that form, that sin of blasphemy is forgivable. What do you mean by that, preacher? I have opportunity to go to my brother and ask him to forgive me and to make it right. So here's how Scripture says it. If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that you blasphemed someone, or if you have an art with your brother, here's what he says. Leave your gift, and then do what? Go and make it right, or ask for forgiveness, repent, restoration, reconciliation, whatever term you want to use. Then he says, do what? Come back and offer your gift. And look at the text. Look at verse. Look at verse. This is interesting. Look with me, um, verse 32. Here's what verse 32 says. But whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, that can be Jesus himself or people of God, notice what it says, will be forgiven. Isn't that interesting? I can even speak negative against the Son of God. Peter found that out. He said some negative things. God forgive him. We blaspheme. We swear. We curse. We do all those things. And here's what 1 John 1 and 9 and says. If we confess our sins, God is what? Faithful and just to do what? Forgive. And to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first form of blasphemy where I might defile you or you might defile me or I might slander your name, all of that is forgivable because once the heart is right, we can go to the brother or sister or to God or to Christ and say, forgive me. Does that make sense? The second type of blasphemy is where the problem comes in. One can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That's the problem, okay? Because here's what the text says. Notice what it says, and then we're going to talk about this. In verse 31, every sin of blasphemy will be forgiven, but the blasphemy, and notice what it says, against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Then the end of 32 says, neither in this age nor in the age to come. Preacher, what is that all about? And what is the text saying about that? So notice what it says. Here's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is by definition. Attributing the work of God's Spirit to his ultimate enemy, Satan. That's where the line in the sand is drawn. I'll explain this. Here's what the Pharisees said. Hey, Jesus, that's not God's kingdom. That's Satan. Beelzebub. Your authority is not from God. It's from Satan. And here's what blasphemy says. Every time God does something and you attach evil to what God did, come on, are you hearing me? That's blasphemy or blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, okay? I want, I want us to understand this quite well because God will not share his glory. Oh, come on, come on. God's going to not have his arch enemy take credit, credibility, come on, for what he did. And, and, and the, the presence and the importance of the Holy Spirit plays a critical role. Let me just share a couple of things, then, then we'll be out of the way. Now, notice this. The importance of the Holy Spirit. Last, 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 the Holy Spirit is both the saving and keeping agent of God. Stop there. Stop there. Very, very important. The Holy Spirit is both the saving and the keeping agent. Uh, say it one more time. The Holy Spirit is both the what? Saving and what? Keep. One more time. One more time. The Holy Spirit is what? Both the saving and the what? Keeping agent. Preacher, what are you talking about? Understand with me. In the Old Testament, here's what would happen. The Spirit of God would land on a person, empower them to do something, then the Spirit would go away. Here's what happens in the New Testament, right? Hey, Pharisees, you want to know why I'm able to cast that demon out? Because my Holy Spirit entered. And when the Holy Spirit enters, guess what happens? 
Demons have to go. Come and, and lock into this. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit doesn't enter and then leave. He stays. So guess what? So no more demons can ever enter again. Oh my gosh. He goes in and he stays. He goes in and he sets up camp. He goes in and he resides. Here is the danger of blasphemy. When you attribute the God who lives in you and you call that God Satan. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You've got a completely different problem and lock into this. It's impossible to be saved because Satan can save no one. So he has keeping power and it enters a person upon salvation and notice how long it keeps them until what? So, so I might get in trouble for this, but here's what that means. When Jesus comes in, there's nothing you can do to kick him out. Because guess what? He binds the what? Strong man. And listen to this. this I'm gonna say this. If you think you know somebody stronger than him that can get him to leave, I, I don't want to even give you scriptures. A couple more. I don't want to confuse. Let me give you a couple more things real quick. So the importance, the unforgivable sin, so listen to this then. The unforgivable sin is not some serious moral failure nor persistence in any particular sin or not even insulting or uh, rejecting Jesus in blindness. It is a conscious rejection of the good power of God. So if I find myself in a habitual lie, I can't say I'm blaspheming. It's something that I can't be forgiven for. If I find myself in an addictive cycle, whatever that may be, or sin cycle, that's not the unforgivable sin. Calvary took care of that. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Calvary, Jesus paid the price on the cross of Calvary for all of that. I can be forgiven for all that. So if you find yourself doing things you ought not be doing, don't call those things unforgivable, right? Here's another question. How can this sin be unforgivable if God is always willing to forgive? Here's the catch 22. Because when I say I've gone beyond the possibility of recovery on the sinner's part and because God respects was that the freedom of a person, it is unrepentable because the person having refused so stubbornly to repent finally becomes, listen to this, unable to repent. Let me say it a different way. Here's why it's unforgivable. Hey, God, you can't forgive me because you don't have the power. And you're just Satan yourself. And here's what he says. Okay. <laughs> and we stay in a perpetual state of sin. Right? Our hearts become hard. Here's Romans, what's it? Romans 128, reprobate mind. Yeah. Right? He gives us over to a reprobate mind because we attribute his power to Satan. And so we're unwilling to forgive because yeah. we don't believe God can do it. And we don't want to give him the power and ability to do it. So we find ourselves in this place of perpetual lostness, if there's such a thing. Okay? A couple more, then I'm done. A couple more than I'm done. Then we're going to pray. So here's some implications. Anyone who believes he or she has committed the unpardonable sin, forgivable sin, you could not have done so. A troubled conscience and that kind of sin cannot coexist. Let me explain. So if you're here and saying, yeah, pastor, I committed the unforgivable sin once. Okay? But then I felt so guilty that I repented, you felt guilty. While sinning, you felt guilty. Hmm. I guess Satan convicted you. <laughs> Interesting. Last I checked, he don't conv convict nobody. Just Come on, y'all. Y'all remember when we used to sin? Come on, don't act like it's been that long ago. Come on, y'all, y'all. Yeah, some of y'all's last night. Amen. How do you? He's just kidding, kidding. Remember before when we used to sin? This, this is what it looked like, right? We go out there and do that thing without remorse. 
We couldn't wait for Friday night to come. Girl, what you doing Friday night? Girl, it's still Sunday night. You know how it is. You got the plan, you know. <laughs> you wait for Friday, right? And you couldn't wait for Friday to come to do what you got to do, right? To do it. Then all of a sudden, as time elapsed, the spirit starts to knock, and he got to get that demon out of you, so he puts a toe in. I wish I had somebody. Girl, what you doing Friday? I don't know. I'm just, this is getting old. I'm starting to feel convicted about, mm, interesting. Wow. That's, that's kind of, then after, girl, what you, I, I'm just going to go to church on Sunday. Really? What is changing? What is changing? He's coming in and he's binding the strong man. I wish I had somebody. And he's cleaning every room. Come on. And if you can ever say, I feel convicted, it is impossible for you to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit work on you. Y'all good with that? So there's hope, right? There's hope, there's hope, there's hope. There's hope, there's hope. So somebody say, what now? Come on, say it. I need to hear you. Say, what now? Say it again. Say, what now? Here's what you do. Live in God's kingdom and just take the enemy down. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on. Just live in his kingdom. Live in his kingdom. Live in his kingdom. Live in his kingdom. And this is what I want us to get today. You've got the power, right? He will try to tempt. He will try to test. He will try everything. Understand, his vantage point is this. He's outside. Don't fool yourself to thinking the devil done got in my head. Really? How'd he come from out here to in there? Let you check. Is Jesus in there? Because if he is, guess where the enemy is? Yeah, you get it. Yeah, you kind of get what I'm saying. Yeah, you get it. You get it. We have power, guys. Our job is to go out there and demolish the enemy's kingdom. Tear it down. Reap havoc. Rebel against the rebellion. Bring people back into relationship with God. We have the power. He has empowered us. His Holy Spirit resides within us. When we show up, demons ought to tremble. Walk in the victory. Walk in the victory. Walk in the victory. 